So um, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce Gerald McKeegan. Uh, Gerald is an astronomer and a teacher of astronomy uh, up at the Chabot Space and Science Center. He's also on the board of directors up there. Um, and he uh, runs a um, program of uh, tracking asteroids, which uh, is the topic of uh, today's talk. So he's extremely well qualified and a very uh, personable fellow. So um, we're very lucky to have you, Gerald, thank you very much for helping us with this. And with that, uh, why don't you go ahead and start? All right. Well, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name again is Gerald McKeegan and I am uh, uh, an astronomer at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Uh, Chabot Space and Science Center is located up in the Oakland Hills. Uh, so I'm gonna start a little um, PowerPoint show here, if you'll bear with me just a second here. All right, can everybody see that? All right, so uh, again, uh, my talk is about uh, asteroids, um, basically about uh, how we search for uh, dangerous near Earth asteroids, tell you a little bit about asteroids and uh, a little bit about the Chabot Space and Science Center as well. Uh, Got to make sure I get this going here. There we go. Um, so this is an image of the Chabot Space and Science Center. Like I said, it's in the Oakland Hills. Uh, it's up on Skyline Boulevard in uh, the uh, Redwood Regional Park, uh, which is right next to Joaquin Miller Park. Uh, it's about 80,000 uh, square feet of uh, exhibit space, classroom space, office space, and so forth. Um, we have quite a few exhibits up there that you can visit, uh, artifacts, uh, activities that you can do. We have a planetarium, we have a theater. <clears throat> um, we have all kinds of events that we would normally be doing, but unfortunately, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center has been closed for a little over a year now. Uh, so we are not doing any live events on site. Uh, however, we are uh, doing virtual events. So we do a virtual telescope program every uh, Saturday night. We uh, put a camera on the telescope and kind of point it different objects and talk a little bit about it, invite people to submit questions. Um, and we also have other virtual classroom activities uh, uh, occasionally on Friday nights and during the week. In fact, some of the, that uh, activity is being done in conjunction with local schools. So we are actually providing virtual content that can be used by the local schools uh, to help teach science and especially astronomy or space related science to uh, the kids in the, in the local school district. Uh, in addition to the exhibits in the, in the planetarium, we also have three uh, telescopes. These are large telescopes that are located uh, on the western edge of the uh, facility. And uh, some of these are, are very interesting antique telescopes. Uh, the small dome that you see on the left that houses uh, the eight inch refracting telescope that we call LEA. We give all of our telescopes names. <clears throat> so LEA is our oldest telescope. It is the original Oakland uh, observatory telescope it was originally installed in what is now downtown Oakland uh, and it was built in 1883 so it's 138 years old and it still works and we would normally uh, back before COVID times we would open that telescope every weekend uh, let people come up and take a look through it uh, it's an eight inch refracting telescope. So it's a long, about an eight foot long tube, eight inches in diameter uh, lens at the front, eyepiece at the back. And like I say, even though it's 138 years old, it still works extremely well. Uh, in the big dome, kind of in the center of that image up above uh, is our uh, longest telescope. This is uh, a 20 inch refracting telescope we call Rachel. And Rachel was built in 1915. 
Uh, and again, it is still a functioning telescope and we still let people view through it. And then over on the right, it's a little hard to see here, uh, but you can see it peeking up out of the roof here. It's a different kind of building. Uh, the older telescopes are in the traditional domes, uh, but this telescope is in a building that's got a rollback roof. So when we are observing with this telescope, uh, that telescope is completely exposed to the sky because we roll the roof all the way back. And that is our newest telescope. It's a 36 inch uh, reflecting telescope. It uses mirrors instead of lenses. Um, and it was built in 2003 and it is our only computer controlled telescope. So we can move it very quickly from one object to another, which is one of the reasons why we decided to go with the rollback roof. Now that telescope is also part of our science program that we do there. We are part of a global uh, network of observatories that searches for and tracks near earth asteroids. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. We, we use this telescope uh, uh, whenever we get a chance to get out there and, and do some asteroid work. And so, you know, that's the, gonna be the main subject of my talk tonight, so, or this afternoon. So let's just get into it and talk about asteroids, what they are and how dangerous they really are. So what is an asteroid? Uh, most of you may think of an asteroid as being some kind of big giant rock out in space. Quite often we think of them as looking kind of like a potato in space. Uh, and we would consider this type of a asteroid what we call a monolithic asteroid. And most people think this is what most asteroids look like, but it turns out most asteroids look very different. Uh, most asteroids are what we call rubble pile asteroids. They're actually agglomerations of many, many, many small rocks uh, with dust and ice in between very loosely held together and very easily broken apart. Uh, and this is actually very common for, for most asteroids. They are of this type until you get into the very large asteroids, which are more solid, more of the monolithic type of asteroid. But uh, most of the smaller asteroids are these rubble pile type asteroids. So where do they come from? <clears throat> Most asteroids are located in what we call the main asteroid belt. So the main asteroid belt is between the orbits of Jupiter, here's the orbit of Jupiter, and the orbit of Mars. And in that region is where we find most asteroids in our solar system. There are literally millions of asteroids out there. We call it the main asteroid belt but it's actually divided into groupings and you get some sense of that just looking at this image here. Uh, some of the asteroids migrate into a, a region that is either 60 degrees in front or 60 degrees behind Jupiter. We call these the Trojan asteroids. Technically the ones behind Jupiter are the Trojans and the ones in front are the Greeks, but we tend to just call them all the Trojan asteroids. Uh, they congregate there because the gravitational pull of Jupiter and the sun balances at these two points. And so it's easy for asteroids to get into that region and kind of stay there for long periods of time. Um, most of the asteroids just orbit fairly stably out in this region. Uh, now, in order to show individual asteroids on, a, on this scale in a, in a diagram like this, we have to show them as dots that are big enough for you to see. And that makes it looks like, look like there's a lot of asteroids out there and they're all very close together. <clears throat> well, there are a lot of asteroids out there, but they're actually not very close together. Uh, a, a drunk astronaut could fly through the asteroid belt blindfolded and be pretty certain of not hitting any of the asteroids in the main asteroid belt. So there's actually a lot of space in between them, but that region is so large, it can hold a lot of asteroids. So we, we are certain that there are several million asteroids out in the main asteroid belt. Now, most of those asteroids orbit stably in that region and they, they stay there. But once in a while, 
something will happen. They'll get perturbed by Jupiter, or they may occasionally bump into another asteroid, or some something else happens that will perturb the orbit of the asteroid and cause it to change from orbiting stably out here and change into an, a, a different orbit that takes it in closer to the sun. And when that happens, if that uh, new orbit takes the asteroid close to the Earth's orbit, we call it a near-Earth asteroid. Now, in addition to asteroids getting close to Earth's orbit, the occasional comet also gets close to the Earth's orbit. So we call all of these objects, whether they're asteroids or comets, we call them near-Earth objects. And near-Earth object, the definition is basically mostly asteroids, but a few comets. Uh, they orbit the sun, and their orbits bring them within 28 million miles of the Earth's orbit. Uh, now, you may ask, why is it that uh, it's 28 million miles? And I'll go back to this other diagram here, and I'll kind of show you why that is. So here you see the Earth's orbit right here. And just inside of it, you see Venus's orbit. Well, it turns out that when Venus is closest to the Earth, it's about 28 million miles away from the Earth. So our definition of a near-Earth object is any object, asteroid or comet, that gets within 28 million miles of the Earth's orbit or closer than Venus would get. And I want to emphasize here that it's Earth's orbit not the Earth itself. An asteroid can come close to or even cross the orbit of the Earth, but if that happens at a point where the Earth is on the opposite side of the sun at that moment, then there's absolutely no danger at all to the Earth. So the, the object gets close to the Earth's orbit, but it doesn't actually get close to the Earth. And so most near-Earth objects Although they get close to the Earth's orbit, they actually don't have much chance of getting close to the Earth itself. So we, um, again, most of these objects are asteroids. So we use the term near-Earth asteroid almost interchangeably with near-Earth object. So when you talk to astronomers who are doing this kind of work, you'll hear them use these two terms interchangeably, near-Earth asteroid and near-Earth object. Technically, a near-Earth object can also be a comet, but most of them are asteroids. These asteroids are uh, out there. They're hard to find, but we have managed to find a little over 25,000. In fact, this number is actually a few weeks old, so it's getting closer now to 26,000 uh, near-Earth asteroids that we have found. Um, but we think that there's actually a lot more out there. Of those roughly 26,000, about 2,300 are what we consider potentially hazardous asteroids. And to be considered a potentially hazardous asteroid, uh, the asteroid has to come even closer. It has to come within about uh, a little less than 5 million miles of the Earth's orbit. And it has to be larger than about 140 meters in size. And that's the definition that NASA uses for an asteroid to be considered a potentially hazardous asteroid, or uh, PHA is the, is the abbreviation that they use. Uh, like I say, we found about uh, a little less than 2,600 or 26,000 of those, but we are quite certain that there's as much as a million or maybe even more that we have not yet found. So there's a real serious effort going on to try to find all of these near earth asteroids, these near earth objects and catalog them and keep track of them. Each year, dozens of asteroids come closer to the earth than the moon. Now, the moon is about 240,000 miles away from the Earth, which is actually a pretty big distance. It's 30 times the diameter of the Earth. Uh, but we kind of use that distance as kind of a, a standard for measuring and trying to assess the population of the total population of the asteroids. 
And so we are able to easily detect asteroids that get closer than that distance. And each year, uh, over well over 100 asteroids get close closer to the Earth than the moon. In fact, this year, so far, since January 1st of 2021, there have been 39 asteroids that have been that have gotten closer to the Earth than the moon. Fortunately, none of them have hit the Earth, but they have whizzed by some of them pretty close. We had one just the other day that actually came closer to the Earth than the geosynchronous ast or satellites that are in orbit around the Earth. So there are a lot of asteroids out there and they do get closer, close to the Earth and occasionally they do impact the Earth. But impacts are very rare. And that's one of the things I wanna leave you with when, when we're done here is understanding that the chance of an impact by an asteroid is actually quite small, but they do happen. So here's some images of some of the impact craters that exist on the Earth. Uh, some of these are quite old. The two up at the top here are well over a million years old. Uh, just by coincidence, both of these uh, are in Canada. Uh, this one uh, down on the lower left is uh, in Australia. It's about 300,000 years old. And then the one on the right, lower right here, this is a smaller impact crater in Egypt. And we think it's about 5,000 years old. Um, some other uh, impacts, one that I'm sure you're familiar with is the Beringer Meteor Crater in uh, Arizona. It's about 30 miles east of Flagstaff, Arizona. It's a impact crater. It's about three quarters of a mile in diameter. Uh, it's about 600 feet deep. And just to get, give you a sense of the size of it, here's the visitor center right there. And, and then this is the parking lot for the visitor center. So you can see it's a pretty big crater. Uh, this crater is about 50,000 years old. We think it was produced by an iron meteorite that was roughly 40 to 50 meters in size. Uh, so pretty good size uh, meteor. And it came down from the north, hit the ground, produced this big crater, um, <clears throat> buried itself into the ground. In fact, the actual meteorite itself, what was left of it was not found directly below the center, it was actually found just outside to the south. Um, here's a, another image looking across it. They have a, a couple of trails to go part way around the, uh, the uh, impact crater. You cannot go down into the, the bottom of it, but you can walk around and get some sense of the size. Uh, you know, this, this is my daughter standing here next to it. And you can't see it very well, but right down in the middle, they've got a life-size uh, uh, astronaut figure standing there and, and you can't even see it in this image. That's how big this crater is. Um, so you can visit this again. It's about 30 miles outside of Flagstaff, Arizona, and they do have uh, some of the remnants of the original meteorite on display there and they've got some other things in their gift shop and so on. So, you know, if you ever get a chance, it's a, a great way to uh, kind of get a sense of what it would be like for for an asteroid to hit the ground. Okay, uh, some other uh, impacts, uh, more recent impacts. In 1908, uh, there was an impact in Russia near Tunguska, Russia, which is out in the middle of Siberia in a very remote location. Uh, and this happened in June of 1908, and this was an airburst. Uh, an asteroid about 40 to 50 meters in size came down uh, over Russia, exploded at about 50,000 feet ab above the ground, and created such a blast from that explosion that it knocked down trees over an area of about 200 square miles. So in this image, you can see what looks like just logs laying on the ground. These are actually trees that were knocked over by the blast from this uh, airburst of uh, the, the meteor that came down uh, over Tunguska. Uh, 
A little more recent event in 2007, an asteroid came down over Carancas, Peru. This is uh, near Lake Titicaca in Peru. Uh, in fact, this region that you see in this image here, this is the floodplain of Lake Titicaca. When it's dry, they use it as farmland. The water table is only a few feet below the surface. So when this uh, asteroid hit the ground and produce this crater, the crater very quickly filled with water and you can just barely see the water down at the bottom of the crater. <clears throat> this was kind of an unusual event. Uh, normally an asteroid that's small, say only a couple of meters across, will burn up in our atmosphere and it won't make it to the ground, it won't produce the crater. So this was kind of the exception to the rule. This one did get to the ground and it did produce a crater. Uh, fortunately, no one was seriously hurt. Uh, there was one gentleman on a bicycle who was knocked over by the, the uh, shockwave from it. It did a little bit of damage to a couple of uh, houses in a nearby village. The worst effect of it was when it uh, impacted and uh, produced this crater, it went all the way down to the water table. This water is very uh brackish and it smells really bad and it released that smell and and the local villagers started getting sick and at first they thought they were getting sick from some mystery gas that came from the meteor but eventually they realized it was just this bog water that was uh at the bottom of the crater uh, a much more recent one some of you probably remember was again over Russia. And this was in 2013 uh, near a town called Chelyabinsk. Uh, an asteroid came down and again, it broke up in the uh, atmosphere. Uh, it, the point where it broke up was actually about 30 miles away from the town of Chelyabinsk. But the shock wave from that explosion actually did quite a bit of damage to buildings in Chalyabinks. It blew out windows, knocked over a few walls, <clears throat> and about 1,500 people were injured. But they were injured by the debris flying from the shockwave. A lot of people uh, ran to the window when they saw this bright flash in the sky. They ran to the window to see what was going on, and about 30 seconds later, the shock wave hit and blew the glass out of the window, blew debris all over, and that's where all the injuries came from. So, uh, you know, I guess they they forgot about their their uh, uh, he, warnings that they used to get back in the 50s and 60s, where if you saw a bright flash, you were supposed to duck and cover. They didn't duck and cover. They all ran to the windows to see what was going on and and got injured because of it. So, you know, this makes it sound like, hey, there's a lot of impacts and, you know, it's pretty dangerous. And of course, if you watch TV, uh, they will, you know, really play up the, the hazard of uh, asteroids. But in fact, the, the risk of an asteroid impact of anybody being hurt or killed by an asteroid impact is extremely small. Uh, and I just want to kind of give you an idea why that is. So we, we divide asteroids up into categories based on their size. Now, the biggest of them are well over one kilometer in size. Uh, the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs was about 10 kilometers in size. But any asteroid larger than about one kilometer can produce uh, a global impact. It, not only will it produce a crater, but uh, ejecta thrown up from that crater uh, will spread very far and wide. It will uh, actually result in secondary impacts because rock from the uh, uh, initial impact will fly up into the sky and actually potentially uh, hundreds of miles away, come back down. They will be superheated so it can produce um, uh, fires and can result in global damage. So this is the type of uh, asteroid that some people refer to as an extinction level event, uh, mostly thanks to the, the dinosaurs. Um, 
but it turns out there's only a, a very few of them. Uh, of all the near-Earth asteroids out there, there's only a very few that are larger than one kilometer. In fact, we think that the number is probably somewhere between 900 and 1,000. And the good news is we have found 95% of those uh, asteroids that are larger than one kilometer. Um, these impacts from this size of a of a uh, asteroid are very very rare. They happen maybe on the order of once every two million to fifty million years. So the chance of a one kilometer or larger uh, asteroid hitting the Earth during any of our lifetimes is just about zero. Uh, so although these are very dramatic and they make great TV or movies it's actually very unlikely that we're ever going to have a problem with an asteroid this big. Again, we found uh, at least 95% of them. <clears throat> We've tracked them and we know that at least for the next thousand years or so, they don't pose a threat to us at all. Uh, the next size category is around 140 to 1000 meters in size. An asteroid this big, doesn't produce a global disaster, it just produces a regional disaster. If say a 300 meter asteroid were to impact on San Francisco, uh, it would do damage as far away as Sacramento or farther. So it's a large region that would be uh, affected by an asteroid this size. Uh, we think there are a few thousand out there uh, the impacts occur at intervals anywhere from a thousand years to a million, maybe two million years, depending on the size. Um, and we've found roughly 50% of these asteroids. The next size category is 30 to 140 uh, meters. These asteroids actually are not likely to produce a crater. More likely what will happen is they will break up as they enter the atmosphere and produce a very powerful air burst that includes a strong jet of vaporized rock and superheated air uh, that will hit the ground as a jet and will produce widespread damage and fires. Uh, over a large area the size of a city. Um, so they are pretty dangerous and there are a lot more of these asteroids. We think there are several thousand of these out there and impacts by asteroids this size uh, range happen about anywhere from 500 to 2000 years uh, intervals. Um, right now we think we've only found somewhere between 10 to 15% of asteroids in this size range. The next size range is uh, 12 to 30 meters. And this would also produce an air burst, uh, but much less dramatic. Uh, in, in some cases, the only thing you'll get is a, a shock wave. Uh, you won't get that jet of superheated matter hitting the ground, uh, but you can get a pretty good shock wave. The Chelyabinsk uh, impact in 2013 was in this category. It was about 17 to 18 meters in, in size. And impacts with, from asteroids this size happen at intervals of 50 to 500 uh, years. And then the, the last category is asteroids smaller than 12 meters. And these asteroids, if they impact the Earth, in almost all cases, they will completely break up in the upper atmosphere. They'll put on a great light show. Uh, you'll see them streaking across the sky and you'll see little bits coming off of it, but that's about it. So there's no risk of uh, damage or in most cases, you know, there's the, the one or two exceptions, but in most cases, these things are just uh, what we call bolides, uh, just bright meteors streaking across the sky. <clears throat> and the thing is, we think that this is by far the largest population of asteroids, uh, easily a million of them out there. And so when you add this all up, it turns out that 
more than 97% of all near-Earth asteroids are smaller than 30 meters and present a very, very small risk to us at all. So, you know, I can typically point to somebody if they ask me, they want to know, you know, what are the chances that I'm going to get hurt or, or killed by an asteroid? And I can tell them pretty conf confidently that there's about a 99.9% .9 that they will or chance that they will never be hurt or killed by an asteroid. Uh, so the risk is actually very small, but, you know, it makes for great, great television. So I'm about halfway through here. So I wanted to just kind of stop for a second and take any questions and uh, then we can resume from here. Um, Thank you, Gerald. Uh, yeah, Audrey had a question. Okay. She asked, couldn't asteroids orbit Earth? It could, and occasionally it does. Uh, if an asteroid gets close enough to the Earth and if its speed relative to the Earth falls within a certain range, it can either go into orbit around the Earth or it can stay in orbit around the sun, but in such a way that it stays close to the Earth. Uh, and in fact, we occasionally have that happen where an asteroid, it's still in orbit around the sun, but its orbit is so close to the Earth and, and so similar to the Earth's orbit that it sort of just seems to move back and forth relative to the Earth uh, in, in what we call a horseshoe orbit. Uh, from our perspective, if we map it, it looks like it's flying kind of in a zigzag thing that goes back and forth from one side to the other of the Earth. Uh, it doesn't look that way if you're observing from outside. But yes, an asteroid can get close to the Earth and be captured by Earth's gravity uh, most of the time, they don't stay in orbit. Uh, they just swing around several times and eventually get ejected back out and, and leave and, and are no longer a threat to the Earth. Thank you. And uh, Audrey's follow-up question is, how do we know how big they are? Uh, well, I'm actually going to show you in a couple minutes, but what we do uh, in most cases, we, we estimate the size based on how bright they are in images that we take with our camera. And I'm actually going to show you that here in a, in a couple of minutes. So uh, uh, I kind of reserved the, the answer to that question for, for a little bit later on in the presentation. All right. Any other questions? Okay, well, let me resume. Did I see a hand come up there just now? Thought I saw a hand come up. Well, okay. Um, uh, Celeste has yeah, got Celeste. her hand up. Okay. So, um, yeah, I did have a question. I'm wondering um, when we're looking to detect asteroids, um, how small an asteroid could we expect to actually detect? Uh, before it either impacts the Earth or passes close by? It depends on how close it is, but we routinely detect asteroids in the three to eight meter size uh, coming close to the Earth. In fact, if you look, you know, I mentioned earlier that there's about 39 asteroids that have come closer to the Earth than the Moon since the first of the year. Most of those asteroids are smaller than 15 meters and quite a few of them fall into that range of say three to eight meters. So we can detect those, but only when they are very close to the Earth. So when they get you know, several million miles away, we can't see them. And what if we were um, hoping for some advance warning so that we could do something uh, if it were if we if we found one? Right. If we were able to discover an impacting asteroid, uh, one of the larger ones, uh, soon enough there is the, uh, the potential for us to go up and deflect it. And there are several different techniques that we can use to deflect an asteroid. But uh, as you say, we need to be able to spot them early. 
And right now, we're not very good at that. Most of the asteroids that come close to the Earth, even the bigger ones, are discovered within days of their closest approach to the Earth, and sometimes days after their closest approach to the Earth. Uh, last year, I believe it was in June, we had an asteroid that was somewhere in the 130 to 140 meter range, and it came closer to the Earth. It was about half the distance, uh, lunar distance uh, to the Earth, and it wasn't detected until two days after it made its closest approach. So that's not how we're going to protect the Earth. We really need to find ways to detect them long before they get close to the Earth. Um, and right now, because we're doing using only ground-based telescopes to find asteroids, uh, that's not very good. We really need to develop a space-based capability to find asteroids. Do, All right. Do we have any potential to spot them with radar or are we still just visual observations? It's primarily visual observation. Radar can spot them. Uh, however, radar can only spot them with very precise pointing. Uh, even when they know that there's an asteroid out there and they want to view it with radar, uh, the radar beam, if you will, is so small that unless they are real precise in pointing that uh, radar system, they won't be able to see it, even if they know there's one out there. Uh, so whenever uh, NASA wants to get radar imagery of a near-Earth asteroid, they will actually go out to the uh, observatory community and ask for very recent observations so that they can be real precise in the pointing. So uh, radar is not a good way to search for and detect asteroids. It's a good way to study asteroids after they've been discovered. I would guess that we just can't, don't have the technology to put enough power into a radar beam to get out very far. That's why you have to have a very narrow focus. Well, it's, it's because of the way radar works, it's a very narrow beam. It's only a, a, a few, you know, at, at a million miles, it's only a few dozen meters wide so if if you see something that's uh and you don't know exactly where it is you can point in that direction and, and you might miss it so we have to be real careful with radar um, a much better way to find it is to use a space-based telescope that searches in the infrared uh, turns out that asteroids because they're absorbing heat from the sun they are quite warm and they're easily spotted with infrared but infrared doesn't work very well on the surface of the earth because most of it is absorbed by our atmosphere but out in space a telescope observing in the infrared part of the spectrum can easily see many many more asteroids than we can see using current technology on the Earth. And there is a proposal, it's called uh, NEOCAM. Uh, actually, it's got a new name, NEOSM, I think it is, um, to put a spacecraft uh, uh, in orbit around the sun in such a way that it can see a much larger region around the Earth. And it would be an infrared telescope. And that's on, on the books at NASA. They just haven't got around to getting the funding for it yet. Fascinating. Thank you. Okay. Well, let me resume my presentation here and talk a little bit more about how we actually find uh, near-Earth asteroids. And I'm going to talk specifically about finding near-Earth asteroids um, using our telescope at the Chabot Space and Science Center. So uh, to begin with, most asteroids are discovered uh, not by amateur uh astronomers, not by lone astronomers working in, you know, some remote uh, uh, observatory. Most of them are discovered by a, a small group of uh, dedicated observatories that use what we call survey telescopes. A survey telescope has a very wide field of view, so it can see a large part of the sky at any given time. <clears throat> and every night, these telescopes survey the sky. They scan large regions of the sky looking for asteroids. 
and there's several of them. There's uh, three of them in Arizona. Uh, two of these that you see here are actually on Mount Lemmon itself. Uh, right next to Mount Lemmon is a another mountain called Mount Bigelow, and one of these is on Mount Bigelow. But we consider them all, all three of them, to be part of what's called the Catalina Sky Survey. Um, and then there are a couple of uh, telescopes in Hawaii, the Pan Stars Telescope. This is Pan Stars One, which has been in operation since I believe 2012, and just recently, within the last two years, uh, a second Pan Stars Telescope has been operating. And again, these are in Hawaii. And there's another survey telescope that's going to come online here in a couple of years in uh, Chile up in the Andes Mountains uh, called the Vera Rubin Observatory. And it's a much larger telescope and uh, it's, it's gonna be really good at finding asteroids because of the way it's designed. Um, and so what these uh, observatories do is they just scan the sky and as they're looking, if they see something moving, uh, they will match it to a large database of known asteroids. And if they can't match it to anything in that database, then they will report that. <clears throat> they don't stick around and, and continue tracking it. They just keep scanning the sky. But they report any new potential new asteroids. And then other observatories will do what we call confirmation and follow up. And there's a large network, it's about 300 observatories around the world that uh, do this confirmation and follow-up work. So uh, they sort of support the survey telescopes. Uh, their job is to, you know, once a survey telescope sees a potential new asteroid, their job is to go look in the same region, uh, see if they can spot it, track it for a while, get lots of data, and then submit that data and to an organization called the Minor Planet Center. The Minor Planet Center is part of the International Astronomical Union. Uh, the Minor Planet Center is located in Massachusetts. And it is sort of the global clearinghouse for all asteroid data from all of these observatories. And if you look at the little yellow dots here, you see there's a whole bunch of them all across the world. This is very much an international activity. <clears throat> it's very uh, common for us to be talking to people in Italy, in France, in Russia, in China, in Australia, in South America. Uh, it, it's there, there are no borders when it comes to searching for near-Earth asteroids because it can hit anybody at any time. So uh, it's a very much an international effort. Um, and again, all of the data are submitted to the Minor Planet Center. They analyze the data, they calculate orbits for these objects, assign designations to them and so forth. And they share all this data with NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. And uh, NASA or JPL actually does more analysis of them, especially assessing the risk of possible impact. And if, if there is something that may be an impact risk, they're the ones that will notify uh, the president. They're the ones who will put out the initial alert to uh, let people know that there's a potential impact. Fortunately, they haven't had to do that very often. Now, one of the dots on this uh, screen here, right up here, is the Chabot Space and Science Center. Our 36-inch telescope is part of this global network. And uh, our objective is, again, not to do the survey work, but to do the confirmation and follow-up work. So if one of the survey telescopes spots a potential new asteroid, uh, we will take their data, we will project it out to where we think it is at the time we're going to be observing, and then attempt to confirm that there is in fact an object there. If we then find it and we're able to uh, calculate its orbit, we will then do follow-up observations over a period of time to better characterize the orbit and estimate uh, the size of the asteroid and so forth. So. Our job is not 
to discover asteroids. Our job is to confirm and follow up on those asteroid discoveries. Um, the data that we get falls into two categories. One is called astrometry. Astrometry is basically getting the position of the asteroid. Uh, we use a coordinate system on the sky that's similar to the GPS coordinate system. So we have an east-west coordinate we call right ascension, <clears throat> and then a north-south coordinate we call declination. And that's how we assign positions to all objects, stars, planets, everything has a set of coordinates, right ascension and declination coordinates. Um, also in our observations, we have to record the exact time of our observations down to the fraction of a second. And it has to be a time that is universally accepted. So we run our clocks uh, using what's called coordinated universal time. And to do that, we have to run special software on our computers. Your computer probably is telling you what time it is right now, uh, but it's likely that it's not correct. It's likely it could be several seconds off. Uh, most modern computers, when you first turn them on, <clears throat> it automatically goes out and checks against a time standard to set the clock. But then if you leave the computer on for a few hours, the clock in your computer will slowly drift and can drift and be off after a few hours, be off by a couple of seconds. That's no good uh, for asteroid work. A couple of seconds can mean the difference between a miss and a hit. Uh, so we have to have our clock on our computer constantly uh, reset in order to make sure we're reporting times very precisely. Um, and so we have special software that does that. It, uh, you know, on the computer that I use when, when I'm doing this work, it resets the clock every 15 minutes. And I've seen it easily be off by two or three tenths of a second just in that 15 minute period. So this, this is really important. The other uh, category of data is what we call photometry. And that's how we determine the size of asteroids. Uh, what we do is we measure how bright the asteroid is at certain wavelengths. And using that information, we make an estimate of the size. And there is a lot of um, assumption that goes into doing this. So when you see data about asteroids, you usually will not see a precise size. You will see a size range estimate. Uh, but the way we get that size range estimate is through this photometry by measuring how bright the asteroid is in the image that we look at and uh, then use comparing that to a set of standards to come up with a size estimate. So uh, I thought I'd just kind of go through the process for you and let you see how it works. So we, st we put a camera on the telescope. It's a specialized camera. It takes really ugly pictures. So we don't get nice, beautiful, colorful images at all. We uh, get black and white images. And what we do is we point the telescope at the sky where we think an asteroid might be, and we take a few images. So typically what we'll take is either three or four images of the same region of the sky where we think the asteroid might be. Uh, again, these are not pretty uh, astronomy images. This is not like what you would see on the internet or you know, in a magazine or book or anything. Uh, these are images of what we call stretched. So we do that in order for the faintest objects in the image to show up relatively easily. So here are four images. Uh, if you're really sharp eyed, uh, you've probably already spotted the asteroid. Uh, if not, I'll help you out here in a second. But this is typically how we get started. We take four images of the sky and then we go through a process where we uh, calibrate the images. Uh, among other things, what we do is we determine 
uh, the coordinates of this, the known stars in the image. So when you saw those four images, most of the stars in those images are well known. They're, they've already been cataloged and we know their exact positions uh, using that right ascension declination coordinate system. <clears throat> So what we want to do is what's called plate solving the images. And that's where we uh, produce an equation that equates the uh, pixel position. You know, all these images are made up of little pixels that are in rows and columns. We wanna be able to convert any pixel position to the corresponding right ascension and declination coordinate. And that depends on the scale of our image, how precisely we have the camera oriented and several other factors. And this plate solving process produces an equation that matches pixel position to right ascension declination coordinates. Once we've done that, we then simply blink through the images. And when you do that, if there's an asteroid there, you see it. And if you have trouble seeing the asteroid, you look for the blue arrow out in space and it will point out the asteroid for you. So, so the, there you see the asteroid moving across the sky. Uh, these are those four images that you saw a second ago. And now we're blinking through them. And by using this plate solving uh, process, we line up the images fairly well. So once we know that we have an asteroid in our, our images, we go back to the each individual image. And uh, again, there's an asteroid. I circled them here so you know where it is. And then we get some data for, for those uh, each image. And again, we're getting the exact time. We're getting the exact position in right ascension and declination. And we're measuring how bright it is. So in this uh, red box here, you see that data. Uh, there's some other information here. This tells us the quality of the image. Uh, it helps us to determine whether we're looking at an actual asteroid or whether we're looking at some hot pixel that's caused by, uh, say, a cosmic ray strike or something like that. Uh, but the data that we report is right here. And this is the, the time data, the right ascension and declination data, and the astrometry, how bright it is at a certain wavelength. In this case, we, we're using the red wavelength to determine how bright it is. And we report that to the Minor Planet Center. And the way we report it is via email. So what we do is we send a specialized email to the Minor Planet Center. It is a text only email. Most of the emails that you're sending nowadays are HTML emails. They're the same format that you would use for a web page. But for submitting data to the Minor Planet Center, we use text only. And the format of the email is very precisely defined. Each line has to have certain information. It has to be in a certain order. And there has to be a certain number of spaces in between uh, each piece of information on the actual observations. And the reason we're doing this is because a human does not read the email initially. It's read by a computer. And that computer takes the data out of the email matches it up to data on the same asteroid that other observatories may have submitted. It calculates the orbit of the asteroid, uh, makes some estimates about the size of the asteroid. Uh, also, make sure that your data is actually good. There's actually a process they go to to verify that your data are good data. Uh, sometimes we make mistakes. And like I say, we may see a hot pixel because of a cosmic ray strike on the camera or something like that and the data would get rejected. Uh, fortunately, most of the time, the, the data are accepted by the computer, combined with other data, and used to determine the orbit and characteristics of the asteroid. For newly discovered asteroids, they do this over two or three nights, 
And once the minor planet center has enough data, then they will assign a designation to the asteroid. They will add it to the master catalog of known uh, asteroids. And, and then it'll be up to us to then continue observing it to do the, the follow-up observations that help us improve that uh, orbit calculation uh, over a period of time. Once all this has been done, and once that asteroid has been assigned a designation and put in the catalog, that information is available to the public. Unlike what you see in the movies, we don't keep it a secret. There is no secret government agency that won't tell you about asteroids coming close to the Earth. It's all public data. It's all shared internationally. And you can go and look it up right now. Uh, there is a website uh, run by the Jet Propulsion Lab. It's called the Center for Near Earth Object Studies. And they have a table that they up, update hourly with new asteroid information. And it will list asteroids that are coming within a certain distance of the Earth, what time, uh, how close it will be, uh, give you an estimate of how fast it's going relative to the Earth, give you an estimate of its size, and uh, you can look it up. And there's even a place where you can click on the, the link for that asteroid and get even more information about it. In fact, you can get overwhelmed with all the information that you can get about the asteroid. So there's, there's no government secrets here. It's all open information. And you can look this up anytime you want to. All right, so that's the process that we go through. And that's my presentation. So I guess we can uh, stop again and take some more questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, Gerald. It's very, very yeah. interesting uh, presentation. And uh, we do have a bit of time here if people want to ask any questions. Okay. Celeste has a question. Okay. Celeste. Oh, um, yeah, you had, you had mentioned the NEOCAM as a proposed mission that doesn't have funding yet. Um, but I was wondering about the WISE or NEOWISE um, infrared telescope and yeah. whether that is operational and is that effective at detecting threats yeah. or is that doing something else? Yeah, NEOWISE is still in operation. Uh, the spacecraft was originally called WISE, Wide Area Infrared Survey uh, Explorer, I think is what the, the acronym stands for. And it was an infrared telescope that was originally used for studying other objects out in space. When it uh, ran out of its major coolant, uh, it was no longer as sensitive as uh, they wanted it to be, but it could still detect infrared objects. So they sort of changed its function and made it uh, useful for looking for uh, asteroids. Uh, again, it was not designed for that, so it's not optimized for that function, but it can find asteroids and it does. Uh, we quite often the asteroid that we're trying to look for and get confirmation data for actually was first spotted by the NEOWISE spacecraft. So WISE became NEOWISE, Near Earth Object, Wide Area Infrared Space Explorer. Um, and it is still operational, but it is, it's kind of getting close to the end of its life here. And again, it was not designed specifically for this, so it's not optimized for searching for uh, near Earth asteroids. The, the, what used to be called NEOCAM, I think is now called NEOSM or something like that. Um, that uh, is a new program that will be a spacecraft that's specifically designed to search for near-Earth asteroids uh, using infrared. And it will be put in an orbit such that it can see a large swath of the sky on either side of the Earth and really give us that long-term warning that we'd like to get uh, so that, you know, if one of them actually has our name on it, we can go out and deflect it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, so I, I wanted to ask about uh, any kind of a military or um, 
uh, security type uh, implications of this kind of work? Because I know there's, uh, well, I should say a lot of us suspect that a lot of the space program uh, overlaps with um, security issues. And this one doesn't seem like there's too much of that there, but maybe there is, I don't know. There, there is some overlap. Uh, there are some military installations that are also surveying the sky, but for a different purpose, for a military purpose. And they're looking for potential incoming uh, attacks. And they do occasionally detect these asteroids. And so they, they're a little more secretive about it, but they do uh, occasionally see things uh, and they submit their data and so on. Uh, but that's not their primary function. This just happens to be, you know, while they're doing their job, they sometimes spot asteroids. Uh, one of the interesting things is uh, if an asteroid, even a small one, were to enter the Earth's atmosphere, it produces a pretty bright flash. And, uh, you know, there are spacecraft, military spacecraft that are specifically for uh watching for potential nuclear uh, explosions or missile launches. And it turns out that the, uh, an asteroid enter the at entering the atmosphere produces a bright flash very much like what you would expect to see from a nuclear explosion. Mm -hmm. And so when those spacecraft were first put up, uh, they got a little worried because they were seeing all these bright flashes and thinking they were seeing nuclear explosions, but it turned out to be uh, just asteroids uh, entering the atmosphere, you know, small asteroids entering the atmosphere and burning up and really wasn't a threat to us at all. Um, and eventually uh, the military figured out a way to distinguish between an asteroid entering the atmosphere and burning up versus a nuclear explosion in the atmosphere. So, um, you know, the military is involved, but that's not their primary purpose. Um, they may get involved if we ever have to actually send a spacecraft up to deflect an asteroid. Um, the military may get involved, but primarily that's not what they do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Charlie, I think he had his hand up. Yeah. Could you say something about how practical the plans for deflection are getting? I mean, for instance, if you've got an asteroid that's mainly a rubble pile, I've read you you can't blow it up because you right. just get right. multiple entries and whatnot. It's, is it still pretty much a dream or could we actually deflect something at this point? There are some technologies uh, that are actually fairly well understood that can deflect detect at, uh, or deflect asteroids. Uh, and you're right, you do not want to uh, send a nuclear uh, explosion or a nuclear device up and blow up an asteroid. Uh, you know, the Bruce Willis thing where you drill a hole in the asteroid and stick a nuclear bomb, that's not a good idea at all. Um, but uh, one technique that you can use for some types of asteroids is to detonate a nuclear explosion, not in it, but near it and that would deflect it. Uh, another technique is what we call the gravity tractor. And that's where you take a spacecraft that's got a lot of mass to it. You send it up and put it in an orbit. So it's just in front of the asteroid. And then the mutual gravitation between the asteroid and the spacecraft will allow the spacecraft to then pull the asteroid into a different trajectory. So you, you, you put the, the spacecraft into orbit, it's in front of the asteroid, and then you fire the thrusters on the, on the spacecraft to just slowly pull away off to one side or another. Mm -hmm. And as you do that, your, the gravitational interaction between the two pulls the asteroid off. And if you can do this years before the date of impact, it takes a very small change in trajectory to uh, deflect the asteroid so it won't hit the Earth. Uh, another option is the what we call the kinetic impactor. And that's where you take a big giant bullet, if you will, and fire it into an asteroid and 
deflect the asteroid. And we're actually going to test that technology. There's a mission that's going to launch, uh, I believe, next year. It's called DART. And they are going to go up uh, to a known uh, near-Earth asteroid that's actually a binary. So it's a, one big asteroid and one small asteroid, and they're orbiting around each other as they also orbit around the, the sun. And the objective of this mission is to actually go up and fire a large, heavy projectile into the smaller of those two asteroids and measure how much of a deflection they get by doing that and use that to calibrate that kinetic impactor concept. Uh, so, you know, there are there are you know, some technology that's being worked on. Uh, there are some other proposals, things like painting the asteroid white so that the sun reflecting off of it changes the asteroid's orbit over a very long period of time. Uh, but any of these techniques requires us to be able to detect an asteroid and realize it's going to impact us years in advance. And right now, we're not very good at doing that. So, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I would guess the right. technological problem is the politics of getting nations to cooperate on doing something. Exactly right. That plus just getting to where we can discover them and, and figure out the orbits, not days in advance of, you know, a near miss, but years in advance. So that's, that's still a long way off yet. Yeah. Other questions. So um, Audrey had a question. All right. So does Celeste, she's actually ahead of me. Oh, okay. Well, let's go to Celeste then. Okay. So um, I was wondering if there's a concern now that I used to hear about that once a country develops the technology um, to deflect an asteroid, then it could use that to instead aim an asteroid at an enemy, and then the impact would just look like an active. You've been watching movies, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> is, that where, is that where that comes from? Yeah, there, there was actually a, 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 I'm not sure if it was a movie or a, a TV miniseries or something like that a couple of years ago that suggested that very idea. Um, so yeah, that is that is a concern. That is a concern. Uh, you know, there's only a few countries that are going to have the technology to deflect an asteroid to begin with. Uh, but you know, one thing people sit around the table and you know, coming up with new things to worry about. That's one of the things that, that they they worry about is that somebody might uh, misuse that technology to actually deflect an asteroid. But to actually do that and get that asteroid to go right where you want it to go at the right time and everything, that's actually really hard. So I doubt if anybody's actually going to attempt to do that. You know, so. okay, Thank you. But it, like I say, there are guys who sit around the table with nothing to do but come up with new things to worry about. And that is one of the things they've come up with, you know. <laughs> All right. okay. Other questions? Audrey, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I had a question. I, you know, in your, I think it was your last slide, you showed a whole bunch of data of the different asteroids that you detected and how fast they were moving and so on. Could you pick one of those out and say, okay, now this means it's going, if it's going 24 kilometers per second, that means it, and it's so far, is it coming toward us? Does that data say that? Does it say? Well let me do this. Let me go back to that slide here and actually interpret what you're seeing in that slide a little bit more here. Yes, so that one. Th this one, right? So so this some of this is just basic, you know, identifying who you are and so on and so forth, uh, what type of telescope you're using. Uh, what kind of a report this is, the date of the report, and how to get in touch with, uh, you know, the, the people making the observations. Uh, but this is the nuts and bolts right here. This is the actual data. And remember how I showed you four separate images earlier when, when I was showing the blinking and so on? In each of those images, it's taken at a slightly different time. It may be five minutes between them. It may be 20 minutes between them or more, depending on how fast the asteroid is moving across the sky. And so these, each of these lines of data represents one of those images. So uh, this is the identification of the object that we were looking at. And initially, it's given a code by whatever 
uh, observatory made the initial discovery of that object. They assign a code to it. It's a temporary code that's only used until the Minor Planet Center uh, gives it a more permanent designation. So this was the code. This was um, by the Catalina Sky Survey. Um, they spotted an object and we went in and tried to do confirmation of that object. This is the date and time code. Uh, the K means uh, we used a, a certain technique to get these images. Uh, this is the date and time. So the year, month, day, and fraction of the day. And you see we carry it out to several decimals. Uh, as I said a while ago, we have to be real precise about uh, our, our timing of these images. These numbers here are the right ascension. And then these numbers here are the declination. Right ascension is the east-west coordinate. Declination is the north-south coordinate. This is the magnitude. Remember how I told you we measure how bright the object is? Uh, in each of the images, we have a, a, a numbered system that we use to measure the brightness. Uh, and it's a kind of a, a, a strange system. Each, each whole number represents a little over two and a half times uh, brighter than the previous whole number. So, a, and, and it goes backwards. So uh, magnitude 18 is two and a half times dimmer than magnitude 17. Uh, and just for reference, the dimmest star that you can see with your naked eye, if you go up high up into the mountains, get far away from the city lights where you see a nice pristine sky, the dimmest star that you can see is about magnitude six. So just for reference, you see here a bunch of numbers that are a little over magnitude 18. So we're talking nearly a million times fainter than that dimmest star that you can see with your naked eye. These things are really dim in these images. <clears throat> this is a code which identifies our observatory. Uh, because we are registered with the Minor Planet Center, they know all we do is give them that code. They know where we are, what our exact geographic location is on the ground, how high above sea level we are, things like that. And that is all incorporated in the calculation that the Minor Planet Center does uh, when they calculate the orbit. If I took all of this data, these four data points, and I put them in orbit calculating software, it would give me an orbit. And I actually do that periodically. There's software that I have uh, at, at the observatory that I can take these data and put it in the uh, software and it will calculate an orbit. But just using four data points like this taken over a relatively short period of time, I get an orbit, but it's not a very accurate orbit. And so what you really want is for a lot more data from more observatories taken over a much longer period of time. And so that's where that confirmation and follow-up process happens. So it really takes two, three, four days of, of observations by several different observatories before you've got enough data to really have a good, accurate orbit. Uh, so that's kind of a long-winded explanation. I hope that answers your question. I appreciate it very much. And I, I just, so the computer will tell you if it's coming, if it's going to come close to us and how soon that could happen. Right. Once you've calculated that orbit, then you can determine where the asteroid will be at any given point in time and, and determine whether it's going to uh, be a risk. And so what happens is we send our data to the Minor Planet Center. They combine our data with data from all these other observatories. Uh, they calculate the orbit, and then they're sharing that data with the Jet Propulsion Lab. And that's the actual organization that, that looks at that data and looks at that calculated orbit and makes a determination about whether there is a potential risk to the Earth. 
and they have a, a whole risk analysis process that they go through. And, uh, you know, again, if, if they see something where there is a reasonable risk of uh, possible impact, they're the ones who will contact the White House and, and activate the process for either uh, evacuating an area or maybe making some attempt to uh, uh, deflect it. Fortunately, Thank there have only been three occasions where they've actually activated that system. And on all three occasions, it was a very small asteroid and turned out wasn't a problem for anybody. So. Good. <laughs> Thank so, you very much. So one sure. of the things that uh, I saw on your data was that there was a slight variation in the uh, brightness of the object. And I wondered if, I mean, uh, to the layman, it looks like if you're in the Bay Area with uh, all this fog and everything, you know, maybe maybe that impacts it. I don't know what kind of imaging you're doing. Can you see through fog? Does it make a difference? Uh, we can't see through fog. In fact, uh, you know, one of the, the downsides of having our observatory at the Chabot Space and Science Center in the Oakland Hills is we get fog a lot and we cannot operate when it's foggy. In fact, even if the humidity is high, if the humidity goes up to say 90 or 95%, we can't operate the telescope because when we roll that roof back and the telescope gets cold, we get condensation on the telescope. So we, we actually have a limit of 85%. If the humidity is greater than 85%, we will shut down the telescope. Um, so we, we can't see through clouds and we can't see through fog, but on clear nights, we can see stuff. Um, the Chabot Space and Science Center's location in the Oakland Hills is not an ideal location for doing this kind of work. You'd rather be much farther away from the city lights and a little bit higher up in elevation and someplace where you don't get fog as often as we do. But uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center has to be within the city limits of Oakland. So uh, it's the best spot we can be <laughs> within the city of Oakland. You know? yeah. so, so what does cause that uh, variation in the brightness? Of the day? A, a, a number of things. Asteroids, as you saw in the, earlier in my presentation, asteroids are not nice, round, uniform mm -hmm. balls. Mm -hmm. They are potato-shaped. They're odd-shaped. And they rotate. Mm -hmm. And so as they rotate, the amount of light that they're reflecting from the sun, what we're seeing is reflected sunlight. So the amount of sunlight that they're reflecting changes moment to moment because the asteroid is rotating. So that's part of it. Plus there are just, you know, you're looking through our atmosphere. There's variations in atmospheric density. Uh, we try to compensate for that a little bit, but no matter what we do, we get a little bit of variation. So, you know, that's again, one of the reasons why we get lots of data because we can average out all that variation to get a much better number. But it would be a lot better to get up in space and uh, absolutely get away right. from the atmosphere. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any other questions that uh, people have to? Um, this is a little nerdish, but when you use the brightness to help calculate the mass of the asteroid, how do you know you're not looking at a pretty much white asteroid one time and a black one the other time? And so there's a big difference in reflection, but it's got nothing to do with yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a, a term we use for the reflectivity of an asteroid or, or any body, you know, even the earth that reflects light from a star, we call it albedo. And, right. and albedo is what we're actually measuring. Um, and there is variation. An asteroid, asteroids are not all the same color. They're not all the same uniform brightness. They don't all reflect the same. So when we do the size calculation, we assume a range of albedos. It's basically a range that goes from about 5%, which means it reflects 5% of the sunlight to about 25%, which means it reflects 25% of the sunlight. So that's the range that we use. And so when you look at that website that I showed you, uh, where it shows the, the range of possible size for the asteroid, uh, that range is based on that range of albedo numbers. So uh, 
If it's a very dark asteroid, it's only going to reflect a little bit of light. So the brightness that we see represents a large size asteroid. On the other hand, if it's a very light colored asteroid, it reflects a lot of light. So that number we get actually represents a smaller asteroid. So the size range we report and, and give you in that table, except if we get it from some other source, that size range is based on the assumed range, possible range of albedo for an asteroid. Now, the exception is if they then go and look at that asteroid with radar, when they look at it with radar, they can actually see the size and shape of the asteroid. And so sometimes you will see much more precise numbers given for the size, and that's because they've surveyed it with, with radar. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think Joe had a question. I did. I missed about a half an hour of your presentation, as I told you, but uh, I, at the risk of asking a question you've already answered, um, is a, a single asteroid or a group of asteroids that whose orbit, composition, shape, or even rotation is simply bizarre and don't match the, all the other types of asteroids? Occasionally we do that. There's actually a wide variety of asteroid types. And we actually have a classification system that we use based on their composition and their structure and so on. Uh, but occasionally we do find things that don't match uh, what we expect. And that does happen, it doesn't happen very often, but yeah, there are times when we have it. Uh, you know, one of the things we talk about is the rotation of an asteroid. And in most cases, an asteroid rotates primarily around one axis. But sometimes you can get an asteroid that rotates around two axes. So it's turning this way, but it's also turning this way. And so you get that combination of two different directions or more. Sometimes they can have three different axes of rotation going on at the same time. And that makes it really hard to try to figure out what the rotation rate of the asteroid is. And the way we do that is by actually looking at that variation that we see in the, the magnitude of the brightness of the asteroid, watching it over time and trying to graphically represent that and use that to calculate the rate of rotation. And if it's only ro rotating around one axis, you get one nice sine wave. But if it's rotating over multiple axes, you have one sine wave superimposed over another or more. So it can get a little confusing at times. And, and yes, things don't always match up exactly to what we are expecting. Hey, Hillary, Hillary wanted to ask something. Oh, well, I uh, just said this is such an enjoyable presentation. And I imagine that, uh, or I understand that you give other presentations, virtual stargazing events. And I was wondering if there's a calendar where we can look up a schedule of those, or if there's a newsletter from Chabot that will tell, tell people what's happening each week. Well, the best thing to do is go to the Chabot Space and Science Center website. It's chabotspace.org. And uh, if you look around, you'll see an events page. And if you look there, it will actually give you the schedule of our presentations plus some of the other presentations that other uh, people do at Chabot. Our virtual telescope program is done every Saturday night. Uh, right now we're doing it starting at nine o'clock uh, and that's where we put a, a camera on the telescope. If the weather is cooperating, we'll put a camera on the telescope and we're actually point it at different objects and let you see what it looks like through the telescope and tell you a little bit about that object. And we take questions from uh, the audience. So, uh, you know, that's something you certainly want to do. Again, that's at nine o'clock. And we do that on Chabot's Facebook and YouTube channels. Uh, but information about it is on the Chabot website, chabotspace.org on the events page. Great, thank you. Okay. So the one other question I wanted to ask is about these meteor showers that we see that come around in August and 
I guess at certain times of year, there's, and I never did understand why there would be a bunch of them at a particular time of year. Okay. Well, meteor showers are usually the result, not of asteroids, but of comets. <clears throat> so uh, you have different comets uh, that uh, come in and they're usually orbiting in very highly elongated orbits, elliptical orbits that bring them in close to the sun and then they go way out to the outer part of the solar system and then they come back in and cyclically orbit around the sun. Uh, if that comet, if the path of that comet happens to pass close to the Earth's orbital path, material left behind by that comet can form a meteor shower. So if you see a comet and you see the comet tail, if you look carefully, there's actually two tails. One is a gas tail and the other is a particle tail. A comet is like a big, we sometimes call it a, a dirty snowball. Some people say it's a, it's a uh, icy dirt ball, uh, but it's, it's a lot of ice with a lot of dirt embedded in the ice. And that's actually, you know, grains of sand and rocks and pebbles and stones and things like that. And what happens is when it gets close to the sun, the ice sublimates, it changes from a solid to a gas, and that's where you get the gas tail. Embedded in the ice is all this rock and pebbles and dirts and grain and grains of sand and so on. And when the ice sublimates, that material is released. And that forms that second tail. And the second tail is a more of an arc, whereas the gas tail is straight, the, the particle tail is more curved. Those particles stay in orbit around the sun and they continue to just orbit around the sun. And again, if the path of that comet comes close to or crosses the Earth's orbit, then that stream of particles is gonna cross the Earth's orbit. And because it's continuous, it just keeps orbiting around the sun. Each year, the Earth will pass through that stream of particles on roughly the same day of the year. So you mentioned in August, in August we have the Perseid meteor shower. Um, and we call it the Perseids because as the earth is passing through the stream of particles, it appears, we're, we're sort of moving in the direction of the Perseus uh, constellations. It appears at all the uh, that direction. So we call it the Perseid meteor shower. Uh, but what's really happening is this is zipping through that stream of particles, the Earth 18 solar skin. So these particles sort of perpendicular atmosphere, they burn up in the atmosphere and we see them as meteors. Uh, that's, uh, there's another major meteor shower in December called the Geminids, and it's the same thing. That one is actually a, a, an object we used to think was just an asteroid, but we couldn't figure out why we were getting all these particles from it. It turns out it's probably an old dead comet, and it's, its orbit takes it so close to the sun that every year when it gets close to the sun, or every three and a half years, I think it is, it gets close to the sun, uh, the solar wind actually blows material off the surface of the asteroid. Also, it, it uh, causes static electrical charges on the surface that cause material actually lift off, off the surface and then that gets left behind. And so it produces this continuous stream of these small particles and these are, you know, grains of sand and little pebbles. There's nothing really big. Uh, and when we pass through that stream of particles, we get a meteor shower. And so that's why they happen every year at roughly the same time. Okay, well, thank you very much for that explanation. So do we have other- That makes sense. <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for uh, your presentation and uh, we really uh, appreciate uh, hey, you being thank with you. us today and so I appreciate all you uh, people who showed up and we'll put it on YouTube and we'll 
get some more uh, viewing out there. All so, right, great. Okay, well, good. Well, 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 you, you folks all have a good rest of your afternoon. Uh -huh. yeah. And once Chabot reopens, I hope you all take some time to come up, come on up and visit us at Chabot. Yeah, we Bless will. You. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Yes, thank you. So nice to see all of you. <laughs> you too, Audrey. <laughs> Take care. Talk, 